coming out on this like gorgeous day. I'm just super excited that the doors can be open during this. Um, yeah, welcome to Chicago Creative Machines Part Two. Um, welcome back to those of you here last week, and um, also to those online. Um, and welcome if you're new. So. Uh, briefly, Chicago Creative Machines is a four-part series here at ESS, highlighting the work of four artists who uh, build machine learning tools and integrate them into their creative process in some way. Uh, original applications of machine learning is sort of the focus here. A um, couple things before we get started. Thank you so much to ESS, to Adam, Olivia, Eddie, um, and also to Kate and Troy for engineering everything. Could we let it up for them? <laughs> They've been so amazing to support this. Thanks also to Media the Foundation and Arts Engine at the University of Michigan for sponsoring this. Um, with some grant funding, uh, it's been an amazing collaborative effort. Uh, I am really excited today to welcome Hunter Brown. Um, Hunter Brown is gonna present to us his custom super collider instrument and the machine learning processes he's built into it. I'm just gonna use my notes here. Uh, Hunter is a composer, improviser, and audio engineer based here in Chicago. His practice is focused on creating unpredictable, idiosyncratic, and unruly interactions with digital technology. And in particular, he's interested in exploring the unstable material properties of digital systems through technologically mediated listening and by pushing the physical mechanisms of digital technology to the threshold of failure. He's the technical director for Ensemble Del Niente and has a uh, computer music record label called Party Perfect, which you should check out. Um, and he also teaches at the University of Chicago. So let's welcome Hunter. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, CSS, for having me. Like Molly said, I, um, today I'm going to talk about a super collider instrument that I've uh, built and been updating and always tweaking and maintaining over the last few years uh, within this instrument are a few machine learning applications I'm gonna kind of do more of a deep dive into um, a little bit about about my background uh, I come to working with computers and computer music from the uh, perspective of uh, a a musician. I have a long background uh, in composing, and I also was a percussionist for a really, really long time. I've like never trained as a computer scientist, so um, I'm gonna do my best to kind of like talk about some of the more technical stuff. But it's not something I'm really too deep into. But I think that what really interests me about working with technology like this is kind of like thinking outside the box, or maybe kind of just trying to intuitively work with these tools and seeing what kind of um, musical and sonic applications I can get from them as somebody who maybe isn't like a fully technically certified um, computer scientist. So the instrument that I'm gonna talk about today, I primarily use in improvisation context. A lot of the work I do in my practice is improvising with other musicians. Um, I play with Molly a lot actually. And uh, so, I've designed this instrument to kind of work well with performing with other instrumentalists, whether they're playing acoustic instruments or whether they're playing other kind of electronic instruments. And yeah, so it's super flexible and I can kind of customize it uh, and kind of um, like chisel it into certain improvisation contexts determining or depending on who I'm playing with and what kind of situation it is. So it's very customizable and flexible. And so what I'm gonna do today, like I said, I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of how it works, how it's set up, and then kind of go into the more uh, nitty gritty details of some of the specific machine learning aspects of the system. So to start, I think about and conceptualize this system in two different parts. One is a part that I call generators, which are essentially synthesizers or samplers, things that I use to generate sound myself and internally to the system. The other half of the system is a part that I call processors, which, are, which is essentially a 16-channel processing matrix where I'm able to process sound 
either from the generators part of my system or any kind of external input to my system. So for instance, like a microphone that's picking up the sound from a saxophone, trumpet, guitar, or whatever, I can take that sound into my system and process it in different ways. So the first thing I will talk about is the, uh, the, um, the generator is part of my system. So I use this, uh, I use this, this iPad, uh, con um, controller software called lemur, which actually is deprecated. So I can't update my iPads until I decide to use the other, um, iPad controller software called touch OSC. Both of these softwares send, uh, OSC data, open sound control is what OSC stands for data to my computer. My computer can also send OSC data to the iPads as well over a Wi-Fi network. You can see I have a little mini router that I carry around with me so that I don't have to change the IP addresses in my system and on my iPads whenever I play. So I can set up my whole setup in like 15 minutes. Um, and here you see I have a, a mirror of my of my generators portion of my instrument, which is all on this iPad here. And I have eight different slots, or I guess 16, but eight on the left, eight on the right, where I'm able to kind of switch between these different synthesis and sampling algorithms that I use. Most of these are empty because I still haven't decided what to do with them yet. So I only am using three on each side of uh, this generator as part of my system. So I'll, I'll quickly walk you through each of them and then I'll move on to the processors part of my instrument. So you can see on number zero on the left side, this is a field recording playback device where I can essentially, I have this bank of, um, this bank of field recordings I can scrub through. You can't, for some reason, this lemur mirror software doesn't show uh, this text box here, but you can see maybe how there's this little tiny, t I know it's really far away, but it, it's essentially just telling me which field recording that I'm gonna play back when I, um, when I press play, so I can play back these kind of messed up field recordings that I've made. I can apply filters to them, like a low pass filter. Yeah, these number boxes don't show the actual frequency value, but use your imagination. You can control the amplitude of these field recordings. And I also am able to kind of save little presets within this part of the system to play back and quickly switch between different field recordings. It also saves the uh, filter settings. I can also choose to play back these sounds at a different rate using this green slider. And it's saved to one of these eight little presets that's, that's within this part of my system. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. I used to have this part of this system where it would extract uh, the main frequencies that um, are in, that are playing through those field recordings and generate them through sine tones. But I removed it because it was causing me a lot of problems. So I'm not gonna talk about it, but that's why you see these buttons here that I'm not talking about. <laughs> um, next, I have a bunch of other synthesizers that I use um, encapsulated into this little block here. The first one is a shepherd's tone generator. If you're not familiar with what a shepherd tone is, it's a synthesizer that always sounds like that it's rising in pitch. It's a psychoacoustic effect. So I can kind of change the parameters of that synthesizer. Change the volume, obviously. 
I also have another state, another setting to this synthesizer, where instead of playing this rising, this rising, uh, this constantly rising pitch effect in a very smooth fashion, I can play it in like a more rhythmic fashion, like this. So it's the same kind of frequency trajectory, but instead of being this really smooth like static increase it's just this like kind of oddball rhythmic thing so that's pretty fun um this other little synthesizer is just a little chaotic synth that kind of generates noise and really high tones I can freeze its state to kind of get a more sustained tone. So that's pretty fun. And then I have this synth that I call an ice synth because it sounds like ice crackling. It's essentially a uh, single sample impulse that's being sent through really, really, really narrow bandpass filters of randomized frequency. So it sounds like these kind of like digital little ice crackles. Sometimes they ring out and create tones, which is pretty fun. So those are some synthesizers I use. This, this module here is actually um, a new one that I just finished this week that involves machine learning. So I'm going to save that for later when I go kind of into depth into the machine learning aspects of my software. Uh, same with these two on the right side. These are also like machine learning based ones. So I'm going to come back to those in a minute. This synthesizer just generates different kinds of noise pads. One has a resonant low pass filter. So it kind of gives more of like a bassy kind of feedback distortion tone. This one uses a resonant high pass filter. I can trigger different states of that filter to create a different uh, noise pad. And this shift button takes those same parameters but shifts them more slightly as opposed to generating a whole new random set of parameters. So it's a way of kind of more subtly changing the sound as opposed to these big jumps in timbre when I trigger a whole new random set of parameters. Um, okay, so that those are the first couple of things I want to talk about in terms of generating synthesized or sampled material. The other things that I'm working with that generates synthesized or sampled sound internally to the system is this uh, MIDI controller here, which is a Korg Nano Pad 2. They're like 30 bucks. They're awesome. Very, very cheap. And essentially all of the buttons I have here are mapped to generate a uh, super chaotic synthesis algorithm. Each one has different parameter settings, so it has a different kind of sound world and timbre. And these are essentially kind of like little algorithmic cells that just endlessly generate these chaotic synthesized materials. And I like using these a lot um, when I'm playing by myself because they will just kind of like generate these, un these, these, these unexpected rhythmic structures or unexpected kind of like pitch structures that I can kind of like improvise with. So it's like kind of something for me to play against when I'm improvising by myself. But I'll give you some examples of what these sound like. And I have a button on this controller here where if I hold it down, it will just continuously hold, hold whatever uh, synthesis algorithm that I've selected. So these are pretty fun. And I'll just play forever and just always keep generating new kinds of materials and sounds. So that's another one. I also, this, all of these 
synthesis algorithms are being passed through this uh, looping device, which uh, essentially detects when a new onset or a new transient and that sound has been detected and then it loops it. So in, like in this example, they heard, you heard that sound that I can loop it with this XY pad and change the speed of the loop. And I can also change uh, the rate of that loop's playback so it'll change its pitch. So it gives me like a super flexible way of just kind of like interjecting and sampling. If you get really high up there, it starts generating tones, which is really, really nice. So yeah, that's another one I'm using a lot. And then I have these, these little, these little guys, these Novation micro dicers, which were originally used for uh, like digital turntables. They don't really, I don't, I don't think they make them anymore, but they're really lovely. And I have this one that generates kind of these like little rhythmic repeating sounds. It sound like roaches or like little bugs crawling around. <laughs> And this little controller, I have the uh, volume of all these synths mapped to this foot pedal, so I'm able to kind of do these kind of... These kind of hands-free uh, amplitude gestures. This little synth also has two other states. You can see here, there are these little buttons that are changing color. The green one will just generate these kind of really dense kind of synthesized uh, drone pads. So this is nice. I can have just one of these going and just have these little subtle, pretty tone clusters. And then this red button on here, I'm able to trigger these um, electromagnetic uh, microphone recordings I made, and they just loop forever. I think each file is like 20 minutes long, so it's just like just these nice little recordings to kind of add some like background texture if if I need that, like in a in an improvisation scenario. And then if I play one of those short guys again, it kills whatever sound was going on previously. Uh, and then I guess the last of my synthesis slash sampling uh, tools that aren't machine learning based that I'm gonna talk about right now are contained on the left part of this MIDI controller here. This is a Keith McMillan Cuneo. It's a lovely MIDI controller. It's my favorite, my first and favorite MIDI controller for a lot of reasons, but it's very, very durable. It's waterproof. There's like a video online of them like, like pouring beer over it and like keep playing. It's like super silly, but <laughs> um, all of the pads are pressure sensitive and all of the pads also have other kinds of functions. For instance, all of these, all of these square pads um, you can send pressure data and XY position of where your finger is on the pad. So you can get three different um, points of data from each of these pads and send it to your software. But uh, for this part of the synthesizer, I have this, I've implemented um, this synthesis algorithm called a, a VOSM speech synthesis algorithm. So it's like one of the earliest speech modeling synthesizers. And I like it because it sounds like a really old speech synthesizer. But it's like so, um, the way that I've implemented it, it's like, I can use it as like a rhythmic kind of thing. Now it's sounding more like a, I guess that's like a human, more like a cat. Um, I can, so I have two different ones, one on the left speaker, one on the right speaker. So I can have some polyphony going on. And I have that same synthesis algorithm 
implement it down here, but in a little bit of a different mode where I have some, um, just like some like generative rhythms that I'm able to control the speed of with the pressure of my finger. And also I'm able to change the, the pitch. And so I use that quite a bit. I also, these two little guys here are turntable um, functions. And that's how kind of how like the, the MIDI controller designed these is to be used as turntables. So I actually like implemented kind of my own turntable emulator in Super Collider. And I also uh, used some recordings of another uh, speech synthesis algorithm that I've been working with called the uh, Pink Trombone. If anyone's not familiar with it, it's a free online synthesizer and it's a physical model of the human vocal tract. And you can actually like, uh, you can like, like the parameters of the synth are like change like the throat diameter or like change the tongue's position like in the mouth. So you get some really, really weird, like uncanny valley vocal synthesis stuff. And so I just did like a bunch of recordings of that synthesizer and then I put them into this turntable emulator. So I'm kind of like, essentially scrubbing through these recordings of these synthesizer uh, um, improvisations that I did. Yeah, it's pretty... Um... It's pretty fun. Right, so that's that. And then the next part of my system that I want to talk about is the processing part of my system which is encapsulated here on uh, this iPad maybe you can see hopefully you can see there's like these like 16 different little squares each of these are an effects processor that I'm able to route any sound to in my system or externally through them. So if you notice um, up here on my screen, these little green buttons, if I touch one of those buttons and then touch one of these blue buttons on my, uh, one of these processing modules, it'll route that sound directly into that. So I can actually, actually like route sounds into this processing matrix um, on the fly as I'm performing. So for instance, I can do something like, uh, like I can send my voice through um, through a harmonizer or any kind of other uh, effect. Let's see. So I can do something like like this. Let's see. This will work. Test. Hey. 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 Test. 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 So I have like, I think over like 60 of these little tiny processing modules. I can send sound to them. I can also route the modules into each other. So I can have like a huge chain of effects that where I'm processing a sound through like eight different effects at one time. And each of those effects are kind of chained together, which allows you to get really, really kind of complex and dense sounds really, really quickly. And another point about this that I really love is that I have eight different uh, presets of this 16 channel matrix that I'm able to switch between on the fly during a performance. So I can essentially have like eight different versions of this whole system saved. And as I change it while I'm playing, the whole system will just reroute itself on the fly. So it's like I can really switch sound worlds at the click of a button, which I really think is useful in a lot of improvisational contexts. Um, so that's kind of like the architecture of my system and how it's set up. And before I go on to talking about the machine learning parts, I'm going to ask anyone if they have any questions or if anything was unclear about kind of like how everything is set up and kind of the concept of how the system is operating. Oh, sure. Yes. Is there just one super collider uh, process then in the background of all this that they're all sending messages to? Do you have, say, multiple programs running, handling the different? Um, or does that matter even? Um, 
So how Super Collider is set up, it's a server client architecture. So there's a server, which is like the audio server, which is where all of the um, audio processing and calculations are happening. And then you have a, a client where you're just sending OSC messages to the server, telling it what to do. And so in SuperCloud, you're going to actually have multiple servers that are running on different threads on your operating system, which can save you like a lot of CPU usage. And actually, this instrument here is running on its own server because it uses single sample, a single sample block size to make the feedback processes really um, sound more analog because it's you know it's calculating sound on at on every sample as opposed to like a block of like 64 like 256 samples like most um, audio software do. So this is running on its own software because if I ran the whole system at a single sample block size, it would be at like 500% CPU usage and would be unusable. So I have this on its own server that's sending sound through a loopback back into the system over the through the audio interface itself rather than um, Internally, so this is actually its own its own complete system. That's like on a different thread on the CPU um, And also the way that I have everything built out is modular and is its own kind of little um, like object in super collider I'm actually able to control whether or not each object is being calculated on the server So therefore I can control how much CPU is being used like very discreetly so for instance with the um, effects matrix that I have I have it set up so that if I have gated one of these processors on or off, that that means it's actually being removed from the server, but its state is being held in the language part. So that when I call, so that so that when I turn that synth back on, the parameters that were there when I when I when I gated it will be sent back immediately. So it's in the same exact state in which I left it. But when I'm not using it, it's not being computed by the CPU at all, which is why I'm able to have almost um, 7,000 different synth um, unit generators, which in Super Collider are essentially things that generate sound on the server, but not all of them are active. So if I was running all of them at once, my computer would probably crash. So I'm able to build this really kind of like huge system and kind of control everything discreetly. Yeah. I hope oh. that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. <laughs> exactly that point. I was like, how are you actually running all this stuff at once? Um, yeah. Any other questions before I move on to the next bit? All right, so in my synthesis, my generator is part of my system. I have three different modules that are using machine learning in some way. The first one I'm gonna talk about is this synth you see here on the right. And I actually have some um, examples that kind of explain how this thing is working. So this, this synthesizer here on the right is a unit generator in Super Collider called FM7. And for those of you who are familiar with synthesizers and especially vintage synthesizers, this unit generator in Super Collider is a emulation of the same circuit that's used in the uh, Yamaha DX7. So it's essentially a six by six sine oscillator matrix where each oscillator's phase can be modulated by any of the other oscillator's output that's inside this circuit. So this unit generator and super collider expects two matrices of data one that sets the oscillator's parameters, and the other one that dictates how much phase modulation is being applied to each of these oscillators in this matrix. So you can think about it like this. This is like an example of what you would send to uh, the control matrix, which is setting the parameters of each of the oscillators in this matrix. So you can see here, like so that the so the first oscillator would have a frequency of 300 hertz the second one would have a frequency of 400 hertz and a phase offset of pi over 2 the third one would have a frequency of 730 hertz 
and then phase, and then the third parameter here is amplitude. So this would be three sine oscillators that were static with a with 300, 400, three, uh, 730 hertz with various different phase parameters and amplitude parameters. Um, and then the second matrix in this synthesis algorithm is the modulation matrix. And so the values in this matrix specify the amount of modulation that each oscillator output has on another oscillator's phase. So it's essentially just determining how much phase modulation is being applied to one of those oscillators in the matrix. <laughs> in the matrix, I don't know why that sounds, <laughs> sounds so funny to me. Um, so here's a simple little example. You can see here, here's the FM7 um, oscillator synthesis module. Here is the uh, data that I'm sending to it. And in the mod matrix, you see here it says row, row I in the matrix refers to the oscillator's phase, to, to, to oscillator I's phase. So like all of these six, these kind of um, six little slots in this matrix are each determining how much effect or how much, or how much each oscillator in this matrix how much of each of these oscillators is being applied to the phase modulation of said oscillator. So I hope my explanation of this is going to make sense. And I think it will make a lot more sense when we hear it. So in this example, I'm modulating the frequency of the first two oscillators in this six by six matrix using a low frequency noise unit generator. So it's essentially just sending out random values to the frequency um, parameter of the sine oscillator in this matrix. And the values it's receiving are between three hertz and 310 hertz. And I'm leaving the phase initial offset and the amplitude of each of these oscillators this, uh, just in their generic stock parameters, zero and one. And then down here, I'm able to dictate how much, how much change the second oscillator is having on the first oscillator's phase. So you can see here, I have this row is determining how much of the phase modulation will be applied to the first oscillator's phase. And each of these slots determines how much strength or how much is being applied from each of these individual oscillators. So, and so actually, you could, in theory, which I will show you how to do in practice, is you could actually use the output from one of these oscillators and have it feed back and modulate its own phase, which is very, very interesting. But this, but in this first example, you'll hear that as this as this oscillator changes frequency, it'll start to modulate the phase of this first oscillator. Here, maybe, uh, yeah, there we go. So you can see when I have my, ma and yeah, sorry, this, this unit generator, mouse X, just, if my mouse is all the way to the left side of the screen, it's outputting zero. Mm -hmm. If it's all the way to the right side of the screen, it's putting out, two pi, and then everywhere in between is a different value on that kind of continuum from zero to two pi. So right now we're just hearing one oscillator move up and down in frequency, well, two of them actually, but then as I start to increase my mouse position, well here as one oscillator is changing in frequency, it's modulating the phase of that first oscillator. As I move my mouse back, you don't hear that phase modulation. Which almost sounds kind of like a little like a bit of of a of of distortion or something. Um, here's a more complex example where I have the same setting of the oscillators before, but then the modulation 
is actually another kind of random value or these random values between zero and pi. And this is where each oscillator's phase is affecting itself. And it's also being added to the second, um, to the uh, second slot, which is essentially the other oscillator. So both, the os both of the oscillators are affecting each other and themselves with this random value. This is gonna to be too loud, I think. So as you can hear, as you said to build this DX7 circuit up, um, using all of the, the the parameters available to your to you, it gets much more complex and like rich and timbre as it goes. So in my system, the way I've implemented this algorithm is I, I, I'm actually doing something similar to this, but I'm using every single slot in the algorithm. And this, I know this code looks a lot different. And the reason I have it written this way is because it's uh, essentially much simpler <laughs> to write it this way. If I wrote this code like this, this would be like, hundreds of lines long. Um, but I do have an example of kind of how this is built out. So essentially I have in every single slot for every single parameter. So where you see these zeros and like for the phase or for the amplitude and the frequency, I have a low frequency solitude oscillator in each of those places. And I'm sending essentially a huge matrix of, of um, synthesis parameters to each of these low frequency salt tooth oscillators that are being placed inside of each of these slots. So essentially what it looks like is this, which is six salt tooth oscillators with four parameters, frequency and this initial phase, multiplication or amplitude and then addition. So just adding on a value to the output of that oscillator. And then these matri these data matrices are essentially the values that I'm sending to the frequency phase amplitude or multiplication and addition parameters of each of these LF saw um, oscillators that are embedded within the slots of this uh, dx7 matrix and this is a lot of synthesis parameters right this is actually how many there are there's 216 parameters at my disposal for controlling the synthesizer which is a lot i mean imagine having a synthesizer in front of you with 216 knobs that would be pretty overwhelming to have to control so this is kind of what it sounds like I'm generating all these parameters using this kind of like random little algorithm. It's kind of nice little like bird chirpy kind of things. So my solution to dealing with controlling the synthesizer is to use a, um, a neural network that takes two points from my from this xy pad and i map the points on this xy pad to a specific set of 216 parameters i'm using to control the synthesizer i actually need to um do something really quick to make this work again so let's see so i have So now you're hearing the synthesizer, which I have this little, um, I have some examples I'm gonna show you of how I do this. So essentially what I wanna be able to do in this synthesizer is take this XY pad and I want to map each corner of that XY pad to a different set of 216 synthesis parameters and then be able to interpolate between them. So as I'm performing, being able to slowly or quickly just move that XY pad and output 
and send these 216 parameters to the synthesizer at one time. Um, so for example, let's say I'm going to do something like this. So here is um, where I'm able to kind of take the, whatever code I'm using to generate these parameters and send it to the FM7 synth itself. So I have these pre-saved and this will generate some kind of drone texture. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick a part or pick a position on my XY pad that I want to map these parameters to and I'm going to save it to a data set that's going to be used to train this neural network to output this data to the synthesizer when my XY pad is in say the bottom right corner. So using this little box that I've made, I'm able to add all that data to that data set. You can see here, I'm starting to create this little data set inside Super Collider to do that. Maybe I'll generate another pad. That sounds nice. I'll, I'll map those parameters to this point in my XY pad. And I'll do this for the rest of the two corners of this synthesis algorithm. That one's nice. So now I have four points, four data sets that are mapping these 216 synthesis parameters to a corner of my XY pad. So now I'm able to train this neural network, which I'm not gonna go into the details of necessarily how this works, because I really don't necessarily understand myself of how they work. Um, but I know the result that it'll give me, which is this ability to kind of interpolate between these different data sets on my XY pad. So if I train this, let's see, I might need to change some of my neural network parameters here. Hopefully this works. Sometimes it takes a second to figure out which parameters will best help it learn. It's looking good. This actually might not. This might not do it. Let's see. Here we go. So I just, I, just, I, I, I say to add one more hidden layer to the network, and now it's now it's happy. So now I can save this as a preset, drone zero. I'll save that to my disk. And now when I reboot my software, I now have this preset set on my FM7 synth and I'm able to interpolate between this huge collection of synthesis parameters just using my XY pad. And what's great about doing it in this way is that all the stuff, all of the positions of this XY pad in the middle, not in the corners, is going to be some unknown parameter set to me. It's always trying to interpolate between those, these huge data sets. This one isn't as interesting and just kind of like noisy when I'm in that middle zone, but I have some other ones that I've made. For instance, here's another one that's really nice. Just all this kind of is really interesting middle portions to this synthesis algorithm. 
Even some points where it just stopped making sound completely for whatever reason. So this is a really nice way of using machine learning both to like control a really, really complicated synthesis algorithm, but also to um, get some interesting sounds that maybe you would not have come up with on your own if you were individually tweaking uh, such a large collection of synthesis parameters. Um, I'm running a little bit behind on time, so I'm going to kind of quickly go to the other two machine learning parts of this software. Um, so the other ones, I'll start with this one. On the right here, I know these, look, these both look kind of similar. This part of my instrument is a algorithm that essentially takes a bunch of little tiny audio samples and organizes them on this XY pad using different types of audio feature extraction algorithms. So for those who, of you who aren't familiar, um, there's a lot of different ways of analyzing audio and kind of the, dis, uh, the internal qualities of a certain sound in, uh, using data. So for this particular part of my system, I'm using um, a analysis tool that analyzes the amplitude of each of these little tiny audio samples and the spectral centroid, which essentially determines how, or it doesn't determine, it describes how like bright or dark the timbre of a sound is. So like if you play like a crash symbol and analyze it using this spectral centroid algorithm, it would say, oh, this is really, really high in like the spectral centroid of this sound. If you played like a bass drum, it would be really, really low, like a really, really low spectral centroid. So I'm able to kind of take a collection of audio samples and organize them on this XY pad so that if I'm over here, I'm playing really high and really loud sounds. Here would be really loud, but really low sounds in between. And this uses a machine learning algorithm called uh, a K nearest neighbor search. So essentially what I'm able to do is take a corpus of audio samples and let's see, I have a quick visual um, example here to show you to, on a visual in a visual way. So I have this, this, this uh, collection of sounds, sounds like this, just kind of like some messed up drum samples. I'm able to take this, uh, this, this, this sound file that has all these um, drum sounds in them. I'm able to slice the buffer of audio into these, I think my, so my, um, my neural network is still training. That's not good. Let's see, I wonder if I, yeah, I forgot to hit, forgot to hit stop. Let's see if I do, please stop. Okay, it's just gonna keep doing its thing then. That's all right. Oh, it's like it stopped now. All right, so I'm cutting I'm cutting these samples into individual little slices using onset detection, which essentially detects in a sound whenever there's like a drum hit, for instance, or whenever like someone plays a new note on a horn. Um, the onset detection algorithm will tell you when that happens. So using this little line of code, I'm able to slice this file into individual little files whenever there's a new drum hit or a new sound. And then what I'm able to do is I'm able to take the spectral centroid and the loudness of each sound and put them into a data set. That finished. And then what I do is I take this data set and I normalize it because the data the way the data is coming out, oh my gosh, this is gonna drive me crazy. I'm sorry about this. I don't know why this is still printing out. Um, because the spectral centroid algorithm is returning a frequency value between 20 to 20,000 
hertz. Uh, I want to normalize this value so that all the values of the whole data set are between zero and one because the output of the XY pad that I'm gonna to use to select or to find the nearest neighbor to where my XY pad is, I need it to be in the same, the same uh, kind of range of data. So here I'm able to fit or train a, uh, a K nearest neighbor decision tree to the data that I just processed and then I'm able to kind of create this map of all of the sound slices that I just made. So if I click these, you'll hear this algorithm is essentially finding the nearest neighbor of where my mouse is. And when I click, it plays whatever the nearest neighbor is. So if I click over here, it's gonna find whatever point is nearest to my mouse. And when I click, it's going to play that little sample. So I'm able to kind of organize all these little slices into this two-dimensional space with um, centroid on the x-axis and loudness on the y-axis. And so then what I can do is map, is, instead of using my mouse, I can use my xy pad to kind of do that same kind of nearest neighbor search. But something I find very useful to do with this data is as you can see there's a lot of like um there's kind of like a lot of like clumping where things are really kind of clumped into one corner so if i'm over here and i'm you know moving around it's like i'm only going to select a few samples and I, what i want to do is, is do the same kind of organization of this data but i want it in a in a in a grid so that it's very very easy to kind of find and move between all of these samples. So what I'm doing here is I'm organizing, I'm redistributing all of these points on this 2D um, plot into a grid, which looks like this. And so my wherever my mouse is, it's very easy for um, it to find the nearest neighbor to where my mouse is, which is a lot more intuitive, I think, than trying to find these little tiny little clumps. And so, yeah, with, uh, so I have all of these pre-saved um, collections of audio samples that I use in my instrument, but I'm also able to build these data sets in real time. So the way I have it set up is that I'm able to record like any kind of input in my system into one of these buffers, do the same processing you just saw, and be able to kind of move through that corpus of data on this two in this two-dimensional space by um, using the same process, but it's all, I can do it while I'm in a performance. So if someone's playing a saxophone, for instance, I can record them, and then I'll process this data, it'll slice it up and analyze it, and then put it into a grid where I'm able to kind of like sample what that player just played into the recording that I, that I made of them. Um, so that's that side. And then I'm going to take four quick minutes to discuss the very last one I have, which is very similar to the, um, to the, module I just showed you, and this is the one over here. And this module implements something called um, concatenative synthesis, which also uses a, a k-dimensional nearest neighbor search, but instead of using an xy pad as input to play back a sample, I'm actually analyzing the sound coming in and using that data to um, find a sound that is very similar or as close the nearest neighbor to what an instrumentalist is playing and play back a sample that the algorithm finds to be as close to that sound as possible. So here I'm going to use the same source audio as an example so you remember what it sounds like. And I'm making a different data set this time, but in, instead of using spectral centroid and uh, loudness, I'm training the data set on a collection of data known as MEL 
frequency catchum coefficients. And essentially what you need to know is that these 13 pieces of data are very apt at describing the timbre of a sound file. So if you gave this algorithm a recording of a clarinet, flute, and violin playing the same exact pitch, it would very easy it would very easily be able to tell the difference between the timbres of these instruments. And so it's very useful um, as a very quick and easy way of just trying to match a sound to another sound because it's focused on the timbre of that said sound. So I can make a data set of the MFCC's Mel frequency catchum so coefficients of the same slices that I had before. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play back that same sound and it's going to be trying to find the nearest neighbor using this tam this timbre data and trying to play back the same clip of itself. This is what it sounds like. So in one speaker, in the, in the, in the left speaker, you'll hear the original file. And in the right speaker, you're going to hear the algorithm trying to find the nearest neighbor in the timbre um, analysis algorithm and playing that back in real time. So let's see what this sounds like. Oh, I forgot to, uh, this is not working. Like, oh, I didn't, um, I didn't fit the tree. Here's your error. So it's pretty close. I mean, the general contour is there. So then you can you can input a different audio source and see how a different piece of audio tries to find the nearest neighbor from that data set that I just trained it on. So I'm, I have this this uh, these vocal samples. You can tell I love the synthesized voice stuff. And let's see what this sounds like trying to find the nearest um, clip from the original source audio that we have analyzed. Pretty interesting. And what's cool about how I'm doing this is that how this is working, I don't wanna to go too deep into the code, but essentially whenever this decision tree receives a trigger, it takes in the MFCCs from the audio that's driving the system and says, hey, what's the nearest neighbor? So you can change the quality of the, the sound quite a bit by changing how this is being triggered. Right now I'm using onset detection in real time. So whenever there's an onset, it's trying to find the nearest neighbor, but you can also just have, say for instance, a bunch of trigger values being sent um, continuously so that, it's, so that it's continuously updating um, this nearest neighbor search, which actually works quite well with this vocal sample. So with sounds that have less like transients or onsets, using that kind of like continuously updating trigger kind of really makes a shadow of that sound as you heard in um, that example there. So I hope that that was clear. I know I was kind of running low on time, so I kind of rushed to that last bit, but those are kind of all of the uh, machine listening and machine learning things that I've implemented in my system. And um, I think we have time for a few questions, yeah? Line, which is uh, what is the source of the neural network object you're using? I wonder if you might talk about like this toolkit that you've used to incorporate machine learning. Oh, like the actual like software library? Yeah. Oh, um, so there's this really great software library that was developed at the University of Huddersfield called the Fluid Corpus Manipulation Toolkit or the Flucoma. Toolkit, and for those of you who use MaxMSP, this library is in, is uh, is incorporated in that software. I think there's a pure data version. I'm not sure, but it has a lot of different um, 
tools for slicing audio into you know data sets, analyzing audio via pitch, loudness, MFCCs, different kind of spectral descriptors. Um, you're able to kind of decompose the audio into different uh, kind of um, ways like like um, a harmonic versus percussive source separator. There's all types of really nice um, uh, tools in here to kind of like make your own custom machine learning systems. It's really great. I just linked it in the YouTube stream if you want to reference it later. There's a link right there. Cool. Anyone else, does anyone else have any questions? When you're developing these tools or like working out new aspects to add to your system, how much of your process relies on sort of having a sound in mind that you're seeking versus discovering sort of sounds and then following the ones that interest you most? It's kind of, I'd say it's a bit of both, but definitely more of the latter. It's like, as you start to work with um, these machine learning um, tools, you start to kind of build a like intuition around them or kind of like understanding how they're gonna to react to certain kinds of source material. So I know the kind of source material that I like to work with. I know like how I can tweak the algorithm to, um, you know, make sounds more that I would be excited about. For instance, like I use like a lot of like rhythmic sounds, like a lot of sounds with like transients. So I know working with like onset detection and like building data sets that way works really well for me because it's more like rhythmic in nature. Um, and so I think that's why I love the Fukoma uh, packages because you can do, you can customize it in a very intuitive way as you're working and like change things really quickly. And so maybe like you have a certain sound in mind, but then as you start working with those tools, you, you, you better build your intuition to kind of like set up systems that you suspect will give you a sound that you're looking for, but it also might give you a different result. Kind of like with the example of the synthesizer that I have with all the different synthesis parameters and then how I don't really know what's in the middle. Like I know I'm gonna like the sound of the four corners that I've added to my data set and then I kind of don't know what's gonna come in the middle. I may like it or I may not, but that's kind of like one of the exciting things for, uh, working with machine learning for me is kind of, I know I'm going to get some cool sounds, but also I'm going to get a lot of sounds I didn't know I wanted, but are going to be cool too. So as a percussionist, do you like, do you also keep playing acoustic instruments? Do you have uh, uh, like a, your own rhythm injected into the system or do you prefer like working with the computer generates the rhythm and, and you're just teaching the computer to get rhythms. Well, as you're gonna see in my performance, I am very much like playing the instrument. Like I am sending sound, like I am able to route sounds within the instrument into all of this machine learning stuff. And I'm also able to play with other acoustic instruments. I actually haven't played percussion in years for a lot of various reasons. The main reason was to kind of like dig really deep into the computer aspect of my practice. Um, I could definitely play drums with this software if I wanted to, but I actually like play with a lot of other like instrumentalists who play acoustic instruments and use information from their sounds like onsets, MFCC data to control all this stuff in real time too. So it's super flexible in that way. And I'm able to like route stuff into these synthesis algorithms on the fly. So if I'm playing with like an ensemble, I can say, oh, I'm gonna take the saxophone player and put them into this thing. Maybe I'll write the I'll route the drummer into this synthesis module. And I'm able to kind of like generate all types of sounds from whoever I'm playing with, or just internally with what I'm working with in the system itself. I hope that answers your question. I think so. Yeah. Cool. Maybe one more question, and then we'll uh, take a little break. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of field recordings do you make? Like, where do you go for your field recordings? Oh, I'm like a. I'm like an obsessive field recorder. I like, I take my field recorder everywhere and I record anything. Um, I especially like doing it when I travel because it helps me. I'm not much of a picture person, so I like keeping field recordings with places I travel to because I think it really um, allows me to have like a very distinct memory and like a very like, sen um, very sensory heavy memory of a place. Um, so I kind of just bring my field recorder everywhere and if, I, if there's a sound that strikes me, I turn the recorder on and just uh, make a document of it. So I have like a lot of nature field recordings, a lot of city field recordings. 
I like making field recordings in my apartment of just like, if I'm like hearing some weird stuff outside, I might just like record through the window or something. Um, it's pretty like improvisatory, I'd say. No, I was just uh, wondering the um, Constellation video where there are two people with, um, with computers and one guy on a cello. Oh, yeah. Is, is all the sound that you're using just coming from him, or do you, or do you also bring in your own? Synthesis it's both. So like I like I was saying, saying earlier, I have like a generator side of my system and a processor side of my system. So I'm able to like generate sound myself, but also process and like sample any kind of external output. So in that video, like I'm like always like recording samples of the cello in real time, doing things with them, or, or while I'm also like like controlling synthesizers at the same time. So I can be controlling like five six different like voices of sound that are happening simultaneously in my system some might be processing a, a, a cellist while i'm also like playing a sine tone it can be any variety of different kind of layers happening at the same time that's a cool performance yeah yeah that was a lot of fun thanks for checking that out cool let's uh let's take a little break thank you so much for walking us through your system that's really amazing um yeah, let's give Hunter like five, ten minutes to set up and come back and he's gonna perform for us, which is super great. Thanks everybody. I appreciate it.
Yeah, welcome back. Thank you so much, Hunter, for that awesome walkthrough of all your tools. Uh, give it up for Hunter Brown. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for sharing by your instruments uh, and your practice and your sounds. Uh, yeah. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. You have a record label called Party Perfect. Where can mm -hmm. folks check it out? Yeah, you check it out on Bandcamp. We also have a website where we sell all of our records directly through the website. If Bandcamp isn't your thing, we've got CDs, digital release, um, a, lot of, a lot of cool records coming out soon. Um, yeah, it's a label focused on computer music. So if you're into computers, maybe check it out. Yep. I can vouch for the records I bought from there. It's great. It's a great label. Um, Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, thank you again to Kate and Troy for engineering. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you to ESN for hosting the series. Uh, quick plug for next week, same time, same place, and also same place on YouTube. Um, we're going to have Julie Zhu. Uh, Julie is coming in from Detroit area. She is a video, audio, and uh, text artist. And um, she focuses on the sound of writing and its correlation to visuals. So it's going to be super fascinating. She's working, she's, she's going to be presenting an in-process piece that she's working with a team to develop where they're building neural networks that generate visuals based on the sound of writing. So it's going to be super fascinating. Um, come check out Julie next week. And then the final week after that will be X Alice Lee who is also a video artist. So I hope to see you there. Uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy the day. Grab a sticker on your way out. Yeah. <laughs>